to verse number 18. I hope this makes sense. In my head, it makes sense. Amen. And I, I, I just want this to come out well. Exodus 22, verse number 18. Very short passage of scripture. It says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Very simple, very direct command from God. You're thinking, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, hopefully by the end of this it will make some sense. In Exodus chapter number 20, we find, that's what I want to minister tonight. Do you want a title? Suffer not the witch to live. Exodus chapter 20, we find the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 21, we get the laws concerning slavery, killing a man, selling a man, stealing a man, smiting your father, cursing your father and your mother, and what to do if your ox hurts someone, what to do if your ox kills somebody. God really breaks down the procedures of what needs to happen. Every circumstance under the sun goes down. That's why a lot of people don't read through the second half of Exodus and read through Numbers and Leviticus because it's a lot of laws, it's a lot of uh, the feasts, it's a lot of this sacrifice is this and this offering is this and this is what you have to do for it. But if you pay attention, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So he starts this thing just after he gives the Ten Commandments, breaking down procedural things as far as what to do if this happens, what to do if that happens. You know, if you put yourself in the children of Israel's position at this point, they have to listen to a man get up there, recite the, the laws of God and the procedures of God for who knows how long it took him to get through everything. Put yourself in Moses' position. He's up there in front of millions of people, and I'm sure as he's going through things, people aren't listening, and they're forgetting what was happening, and what you say about this, and, and I'm sure it just took a lot longer. We get tired after 30 minutes of preaching, but go through laws and regulations. If you were at a work meeting for more than 30 minutes, you'd freak out. They had to do this for hours upon hours, day after day, listening and, and recording the laws of God. So we find that after they're going through this in Exodus 21, that most of the punishments for breaking the laws of killing and cursing your parents are death. But the rest of the commandments that are there could be done instead of death, such as restoring animals, returning goods, or giving back a slave, or etc. You can go through the list, read through Exodus 21 and Exodus chapter 22. But the list carries on in Leviticus chapter number 12 through chapter number 17. And some of the others, we find that there were procedures for people with things such as leprosy, women that had an issue of blood, and other situations regarding disease and treating people, how you treated people. The thing is, if you read through these chapters and others in Leviticus, you will find that if they had a disease or if they had sickness or if they committed adultery, they would have to go through a cleansing process. For example, there are multiple chapters on leprosy alone in, Exodus, or in Leviticus, I think it's 13, 14, and 15. But if a leper was found in the camp, this is some of the procedures they had to go through. They had to show themselves to the priests. The priests would then determine the severeness of it and make a call. Should they go out of the camp or should they be allowed to stay in the camp? And depending on if you read through it, I mean, it gets pretty detailed. If it's so big and if it's misshapen, if it's red or white, if the skin is flaking off, it's on the top of the head versus the arm versus the foot. I mean, there was all these specifications about a leper. But it was up to the priest to decide where it was at and what needed to be done. Sometimes they would have to leave camp for a week and then wash themselves and show themselves back to the priest. And then the priest would make a call. Are they clean or not clean? And if so, they may have to leave for 14 days or 30 days or go through another type of a cleansing process. But once they were deemed clean, then they would have to sacrifice an offering of a certain animals and they were allowed back into the camp. In other words, there was a way for them to get right. There was a way for an adulterer to be restored. There was a way for a thief to be restored. There was a way for a sick person to be restored. There was a way for somebody who beat somebody or a servant or a slave to be restored. But God clearly stated that a witch was not allowed to live. I find it interesting that in Exodus 21 and 22 and Leviticus 12 through 17 that God is speaking in terms of restoring property. If a fire breaks out, borrow your neighbor's cattle or oxen, you can restore these things if they were killed or if they became sick or injured or offer somebody, but they could get reestablished into the nation. But then in verse 18 of Exodus 22, you get hit in the head with, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Why in the middle of all of this restoration would God say, 
suffer not a witch to live. Well, if you understand witchcraft, let me just break it down a little bit. Witchcraft was a practice done by women and is still practiced today. Witches believe in, in a lot of different chants. They believe they have the power to curse and the power to heal and the power to look into the future. They have a, a lot of power, godlike powers, if you will. They know the power of prayer. They know the power of worship and rituals. And they use them to solve problems that afflict people. They did so in the past and continue to do so in the present. For example, if you understand the power of affirmations or what they call chants that are often used in their prayers, they believe that when they focus and concentrate, their affirmations or their chants acquire powerful energy. And a special kind of environment becomes created, which is conductive to the performance of worship. Witches, for example, burn fragrant candles and incense, draw circles as they utter chants and perform their rituals. They com the, the combined impact of these practices work like magic. But they believe they have the power to heal, the power to curse. They believe that they are working for a higher power. They use the chance to try to sway people. They are con artists. They have a unique ability to get someone to do what they want. In the Bible days, they would speak and do things contrary to the word of the Lord. They would try and sway the people by getting them to believe the word of the prophet was not right and that they were truly the ones hearing from God. If a man of God said there would be famine, then the witches would predict harvest. If the man of God said there would be captivity, the witches would say the exact opposite. Clark's commentary says it this way. They were seducers of the people from their allegiance to God, on whose judgment alone they should depend. And by impiously prying into futurity, assumed an attribute of God in foretelling of future events, which implied in itself the grossest blasphemy, intended to corrupt the minds of the people by leading them away from God and the revelation he had made of himself. Many of the Israelites had no doubt learned these curious arts from their long residence with the Egyptians, and so much were the Israelites attached to them that we find in such re repute among them. And various practices of this kind prevailed through the whole of the Jewish history, notwithstanding the offense was capital, in all cases were punished by death. People would begin to seek their counsel instead of the counsel of the man of God. They would steal the hearts and minds of the people. That is why God said to not let a witch live. His command was, if you see a witch, kill her, because she will cause harm and division in the people. God was making it very clear that it was his way or there was no way. He was making it clear that there was an enemy that would like to build up his own kingdom, and we need to be aware of the witches that try to come into our lives and try to run our lives. You see, it's the power of the witch that was enabling them to control these people and try to get them to do things that they normally would not do. That's the power that a witch would have. And he said, we need to obey God. The first thing is, fear God and obey his commandments. But the witch was there to try to get them to do what she wanted or what their power wanted them to do. It made people not be themselves. It made them reach out and say things they normally wouldn't say. Do things they normally wouldn't do. Essentially, they became a different person than what they were. So let me go further. First Samuel chapter 15. We touched on this a couple weeks ago, but allow me to just re recover a little ground real quick. First Samuel chapter 15, beginning at verse number 2. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. A slave both man and woman, infant, suckling, ox and sheep, and camel and ass. We know the story, but just give me a moment. I just want to touch on this before we move into something else. The word of God is very clear. Samuel tells Saul, go and kill everything. Every, every person, every animal. Make sure you destroy everything. Because of what Amalek did, and if you study back through Deuteronomy, I believe it is, it talks about how the Amalekites would come in from behind and, and kill the Israelites from the rear. They would pick off the weak, and they would pick off the elderly. They would pick off those that were not able to fight well, those that were lagging behind from the, the safety net of all the nation of Israel. And so because of what they did, he said, I'm going to wipe Amalek off the face of the earth. So go and kill everything, kill every animal, every person. And we know in 1 Samuel, skip down to chapter 15, skip down to verse number 8, verse number 9, 
We know that Saul, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And would utterly destroy them, but everything was vile and refused that they destroyed utterly. Here we find that Saul doesn't kill everything, but leaves the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. On top of that, he left the head of the nation alive. The head of the nation left King Agag alive. Why in the world did he leave the king? I have no idea. But Samuel comes in, and we skip down to verse number 18. Questions him about what he heard about what transpired in the field. The Lord sent thee on a journey, verse number 18 of 1 Samuel 15. The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them till they be consumed. Wherefore didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil of this evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul then goes on to say that he had obeyed the voice of the Lord and that it was the people who spared the best of everything else. It was the people that spared Agag. The Samuel's response to Saul is found in verse number 22 and 23. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken that of the fat of rams. Verse number 23 I find very interesting, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. I find it interesting that he uses the phrase, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Why would rebellion be likened to witchcraft? Why would those two be essentially the same thing as what Samuel was saying? Listen, Webster's Dictionary defines rebellion as the resistance or defiance of any authority, control, or tradition. The resistance or the resistance or to defiance of any authority, control, or tradition. When somebody rebels, they are defying authority. They want to do it their own way, not heeding the commandments of the Lord. Sounds a lot like witchcraft. Witchcraft made people do things they normally would not do. Fall under a spell, if you will. Essentially, they temporarily are not themselves. They become this other person. By having rebellion in your life, you defy the authority and the commandments of God. You become a person like you're not acting like you normally act. It's as if you are under a spell or under a trance or under a curse. It makes you do things that you normally would not do. It pollutes your thinking. Amen. Have you ever been rebellious? You know that it's not you. You're normally an obedient person, but when you get the rebellious spirit on you, it's like you can't control yourself. We look at our kids sometimes when they're rebellious, it's like they just can't control themselves. I wondered a time or two what spirit has possessed my son because he went from being this child that was so sweet and so obedient to almost a hellion at times. Today I saw him screaming the whole worship service, wondering in my own self what the world has possessed my child. I got to get the bottle of oil, which I think we left up at Bailey Hall about the sprinkle and the power of Christ compels you and get the, the demons out of my child. You see, because when you are rebellious, you're not acting like yourself. It's as if you are under a trance. You're just not the same person. It's the same thing as rebellion as the sin of witchcraft. It's just as a witch wasn't allowed to live. Neither can rebellion be allowed to live. Rebellion will lead to the same result as witchcraft. And that ultimately is death. Rebellion will ultimately lead to death. When you rebel against the commandments of God, we know that means you live a life of sin. And we know that the wages of sin is death. Just like if you were in witchcraft, it ultimately led you to a life of death. If you were found under a spell, you were put to death. If you practiced witchcraft, you were put to death. The same thing can be said with rebellion. Just as witchcraft causes division in that day, rebellion is what causes division today. Rebellion gets into people and they start questioning, well, this isn't necessary and that isn't necessary. And all of a sudden our thinking gets messed up and we try to do it our own way and Instead of the way that God has ordained it to be done. And by doing so, it causes division in a church and division in a family. It ultimately will lead to a spiritual death. And we know, as I spoke a couple weeks ago, that Saul lost his ministry because of rebellion. 
Saul lost his kingdom because of rebellion. And Saul never saw Samuel again because of rebellion. So we know that witchcraft was immediate death. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. But rebellion in the Bible is from, it is from, from the word M-R-I-Y, which is Marie. If you want to, the technical pronunciation is Marie. It means to be contentious, to be rebellious, to be refractory, to be disobedient towards or rebellious against. We know that. It's the same as the English definition. But if you look at the root word of rebellion, of the M-R-I-Y. If you look at the root word of it, it is M-A-R-A-H, which is Mara, which means what? Who knows what that means? Besides my wife, she knows. It means to be bitter. The root of rebellion is bitterness. The root of rebellion is bitterness. The same word that Mara M-A-R-A-H, the same word is used when Naomi finds out that her sons were dead in Ruth chapter number 1 and verse number 20. The Bible says that she called to them, call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. She was bitter. The same word is used in Exodus chapter number 15, verse number 23. The story of Israel, when they came to Mara. They could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. The root of rebellion is bitterness. Wow. The thing that I find interesting is a lot of times we think rebellion. Now, with kids, it might be a little bit differently, but rebellion in adults stems from something. Adults don't automatically, they just don't become rebellious. There's a root to the problem. There's something causing them to be rebellious. A, a three-year-old or a five-year-old, you may not, they may not get to watch a TV show or they may not get to wear their favorite shirt. My son's obsessed with a shirt and he doesn't get to wear it. It's like World War III. There's, there's no rhyme or reason to a child's rebellion. It just happens. But to an adult, there is a rhyme and there is a reason to it. People don't just start acting out and start becoming disobedient and start causing problems. There is a reason for that. And the, what it's showing us here tonight is it starts with bitterness. And the Bible is very clear about bitterness. How that bitterness is a root. I think it says in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 15. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. Lest by any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby many be defiled. So if you know anything about a root, what is the purpose of a root? The root is there. It's what pulls the life in. It's what pulls the nutrients into the plant. The roots dig themselves. They give stability to the plant. If the tree is going to grow very tall, it needs a big root system. It needs to spread itself out. It needs to go deep into the ground so when the wind comes that it doesn't fall over. It gets deep into the ground so when the water comes that it can get water. It can get nutrients from the soil and thus providing food and, and, and life to that tree. If a root of bitterness begins to creep into our lives, then the whole plant becomes devoured. When you get bitterness being sucked into your life, that causes rebellion. It causes you to look at somebody, especially somebody in authority. When you get bitter towards somebody in authority, then that allows you to, to lash out in rebellion, being disobedient, saying, ah, we don't need all that stuff. You're a dictator. You're putting your finger. You're a cult. You're this. You're that. You're the other. And rebellion begins to come out. If we allow bitterness to be a part of us, then the whole plant is going to become bitter, and ultimately it will die. But we need to make sure that we keep bitterness out of our lives. The Bible says in Galatians chapter number 5, verses 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice there, is it possible, he says in verse number 20, idolatry and then witchcraft. Is it possible that what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 5 is that bitterness is as bad as adultery and fornication? And the rest of all that stuff that is in the works of the flesh that's listed between verses 19 and verse number 21. Is it possible that bitterness is as bad as all these things of which the ultimate punishment is? They would
which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why it's so important that we practice forgiveness. That's why it's so important that we practice love. That's why it's so important that we go out of our way and we talk a lot about this, I believe it was last year, and having therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. What defeats bitterness is forgiveness. What defeats bitterness is love. What defeats bitterness is just going out and, and taking the opportunity and blessing somebody else. All of those things prevent bitterness from happening in our lives. That's why the Bible talks about that we would know them by their fruits, that we would show love one to another. In the world that we live in, we know and understand that people are out for themselves. People are very bitter. Groups are bitter. Kids are bitter against their parents. Parents against their kids. Husbands against their wives. Families against each other. People are holding grudges and being bitter one towards another. We've got to make sure that we do not suffer the witch to live in our lives. That means witchcraft, yes, but I'm talking about rebellion. I'm talking about bitterness. We need to make sure that we line up to the word of God. We need to make sure that it is line upon line, precept upon precept. We need to make sure that the commandments, God doesn't just write some stuff in the Bible because he thought it sounded good. He wrote it in the Bible to be followed and for us as the children of God and the elect of God to maintain the commandments. Because in the commandments there is life. Inside of the commandments there is protection. Inside of the commandments we know that we can have eternal life in heaven. We've got to make sure that we don't suffer the witch to live. In that day it was literally witchcraft. But in our day the witchcraft takes a form in a different way. In the form of bitterness. And in the form of rebellion. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 and 32 say it this way. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with malice, with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Bitterness is a root that will ultimately destroy you. So her and hey, she goes, this is just going to like ruin my week. But if we allow things like that to, there are going to be mishaps, but if we allow those things to eat at us, that can become a root of bitterness. It can become something that becomes a part of us, and then we feast on it, and then all week and all day, that's what you're thinking about. If somebody hurts you, if somebody speaks bad of you, then that's something in our human nature, what we do is we think about it, we dwell on it, and then we twist it around 5,000 ways, and then the devil twists it 5,000 more ways, and then we're thinking, oh, this person hates me, and, and now I don't like them, and I don't want to see them, I don't want to talk to them, and now it breeds unforgiveness, and then the list can just go on and on and on, all because of something small. Now, that was just an example, but we all have things in our lives that we allow a word to come out, or we allow a situation at work, or we allow somebody that does something towards us. It just eats at us, and eats at us, and it, all of a sudden, our root isn't into the living waters, like the Bible says, that we have inside of us. We pluck ourselves out of the living waters, and we allow ourselves to draw from Mara, the bitter waters that Israel was camped by, and then pretty soon, you're in a bad mood all the time, you're negative, and then all of a sudden, you start thinking about, why? Well, should be doing this, and then you start thinking about church stuff, and then you start getting negative towards the church and the service, and who's singing, and who's preaching, and what's being preached, and how long the service is, and all of a sudden, I mean, I'm telling you, it just gets blown away out of control, and you look at me like I'm crazy, but I'm telling you, you know it's true, it gets blown out of proportion, out of proportion, and if we don't take care of it right away, it will consume you, and it will eat you, that's why God was very clear, some things are allowed to live, and some things have to die, some things can be took out of the camp and restored and brought back into the camp, but there are some things that if you notice it, you got to kill it right away, because if you don't kill it, it will consume you, and it will ultimately kill you as your walk with God. Amen. That's why we can't allow the witch to live. I'm not talking about just witchcraft, I'm talking about rebellion, and I'm talking about bitterness. If you start seeing in your life that you feel that rebellious spirit coming up, and you start feeling like you shouldn't do this, and you know God told you otherwise, or you know that we believe otherwise, you need to check yourself and say, I'm not going to allow that thought to live. I'm going to kill it right now because I'm not going to suffer a witch to live. Because if a witch was allowed to live, you've ever been a part, I've never done soothsaying, I've never went to a fortune teller, I've never done any of that stuff. I want to go to one one day and just ask them when the Lord's coming, since they know so much. If I could just ask them, 
with the Lord's coming. Because the Bible said no man knows the day or the hour. So I just believe you know everything. So just tell me when the rapture's taking place. This would be my little shit before. I don't know if you can take that for its word. Which is if they were allowed to live, they had a very center of influence. And they had the power very quickly to corrupt multiple minds. And it's just like us. You know how good news travels fast? If you've got healings and you go out and you tell everybody? Well, if a witch was allowed to manipulate the mind of a person, then they go in and they tell their family. Once the spirit comes in and it attaches, it's like it's a leech. It, it, it just attaches, it sucks the life out, and then it moves on to the next person. And it spreads like wildfire. That's why God said you cannot allow this thing to live because if you do, it will come into a family and that family will go into the clan, it will go into the tribe, it will go into that nation and then pretty soon all of Israel is going to be infected from the inside out. That's why he said you've got to make sure that you kill it right away. The same thing is with the church. If you start sensing rebellion in your life, if you start sensing yourself being bitter and being negative, you've got to, you've got to come and get prayed for or whatever. You've got to make sure that you let that thing die in your life. Because if you do, then you're going to infect the person sitting next to you. And you're going to infect your family when you go home and you start speaking bad about somebody at the church. Or you start speaking bad about the pastor or the service and whatnot. They, kids are very intuitive. They can pick up on some things. And then pretty soon they start yapping. And they start talking to their friends. And pretty soon it breaks out like wildfire. And that little thing that you said, that little thing that you let live will consume your life and will ultimately destroy or cause a massive church split. So we've got to make sure that we do not suffer the witch to live. But I want to go further. Numbers chapter 33. This is why it's important. I hope this is making sense. So, Numbers chapter 33. Verses 8 and 9. What happens if you can get past bitterness? The Bible says they departed from before by Hatharah, whatever. I speak in tongues to say that word. Passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness and went three days' journey to the wilderness of Ethan and pitched in Marah. And they removed from Marah and came to Elam. And in Elam were twelve fountains of water, three score and ten palm trees, and they pitched there. What I like about Numbers chapter 33, if you've ever read this, but it, it takes you from point to point of where Israel journeyed. And Moses is essentially doing a, a recap, if you will, of every place that they've been to from the time that they walked out of Egypt, every place at camp, what happened at that place, and where they went next. And I started going through and looking up the names, because I don't know, I'm just, I'm fascinated by that stuff now. And so I went through and looked up every name of the place that they dwelt. And I'm going to talk about it one day, but not today. But it's interesting to find that if you look at the journey that Israel took from the, uh, from the Red Sea or from Egypt to the Promised Land, it's a lot of our spiritual journey. Some of the things that they encounter is the same things that we encounter. Because the name of the place, they were named that for a reason. That was a stronghold that was over that region. They, they, God gave cities names for a reason. It wasn't just something that somebody came up with. Something significant happened there. Or God was trying to show something. So you can find in this path. But we find here that tomorrow we know that that meant bitterness. But when they got over the bitterness, the Bible says that they went to Elam. And there was fountains of water. Elam means a place of palm trees and a place of rest. That if we, essentially what God is saying is, is if we can get through bitterness, on the other side of bitterness, on the other side of rebellion, is there is peace and there is rest. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to kick back under a palm tree. Because to me, that means it's warm. <laughs> Praise God. Palm trees mean warm. It means a tropical climate. It means I'm going to have to wear a, a snow boots and my winter coat. It means I can lay out, get a tan, or in my case, burn like crazy. And for me, it's a place of relaxation. There's nothing to me like getting under a palm tree, especially in the shade for me, and getting on a... a you know, the chair and just lay out, just either read a book or listen to music or whatever. Get in the pool or something because it's just it's relaxing to me. Bitterness creates such strife and chaos and tension. That when you get through that, if you can understand if we can get bitterness to die, we can learn to forgive and learn to love each other. On the other side, there is rest. 
On the other side, there are palm trees. On the other side, there are fountains of water. Not just a fountain, but there are fountains of water. Hallelujah. Three score and ten palm trees. Seventy palm trees were there in Elam. If we can get past bitterness, there is a place of rest for you and for me. In Ruth chapter number four, Brother Spike can come. I'm almost finished. Amen. I'm still a little sick, so I'm trying to contain myself. Ruth chapter number four. We know that in the story of Ruth, we read this earlier, that Naomi called herself bitter because of what happened to her sons. She lost her two oldest sons. We know that her and Orba, Ruth and Orba, Orba turned around and went back to the people, the Midianites, but Ruth, the Bible says, claimed to Naomi. She said, where you go, I'm going to go. Your God will be my God. Your people, my people. Where you die, I'm going to die. That's, where, that's what's going to happen. They're stuck with me. It's like, why not rice? I'm on you. I'm not leaving you. I'm going to be with you to the very end. But the Bible says, she said, don't call me Naomi. She said, call me Mara. Call me bitter because God has dealt bitter. Bitterly with me. Now this is what happened. She allowed witchcraft, or she allowed the witch to live. If you let me say it that way, she allowed the witch to live in her life bitterness. It could ultimately could have destroyed her life. She goes back. If you've ever read the story of Ruth, it's only four chapters long, I believe. You can read it in the night. It's, it's a very good story. And then for those of you that like to read good stories, you don't have to look at all the other novels. You can read the Bible. It's got everything you need. Amen. Amen. But well, you find in this story that they go back. Naomi doesn't want to talk to anybody because she's bitter. She's got nothing good to say to anybody. But as she gets around Ruth, and as she begins to realize some blessings that are being imparted to her, and they understand the story of Boaz. Boaz was a man, the kinsman of Ruth and Naomi. And Naomi says, why don't you go and chase after that guy? He's going to be a good man for you. He'll take good care of you. So they devise a plan. She goes and falls asleep at his feet. He gets up and marries her. If you ever, like I said, read the story. It's very fascinating. But we find that he get, they end up and they get married. But if you look at Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse number 13, this is right at the tail end of the book of Ruth. So Boaz, well, before I read this, let me just say this. If you read throughout chapters 2 and chapter 3, you'll find that Naomi begins to say, Blessed are you. Because of this. Blessed are you, Ruth. That God's going to do this for you. But she and her own self, she was still bitter. Okay? She's still bitter. But Ruth chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth. And she was his wife. And when she, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. And the woman said to Naomi, this is what the women said. Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Listen to what it says. He shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. So that which was bitter is now going to be restored. And a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. Understand at this point, all she could think about was she had lost. She became bitter. My sons are gone. But listen to what the women said. She said, she, this woman Ruth, has been better than seven sons. And you should be blessed. Then verse number 16, Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became a nurse unto it. And the women her, the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. What happens when you get over bitterness? You get over rebellion. God allows the child to be born. God allows you to be able to conceive. Because when you're bitter, it's hard to conceive. But when you just relax and you get to that place of rest, when you go from bar to Elam and you get to a place of rest, and you're no longer bitter and you're no longer rebellious, then God will open your womb and God will let you conceive. And I'm not talking about naturally right now. I'm talking about maybe even was naturally for us. Maybe my wife, maybe my was bitter. I, Probably was for a little while. We couldn't have kids, but when we finally got the word it was going to happen, we just relaxed. 
got to a place of maybe Elam, the palm trees. I went to my happy place, palm trees, warm weather, and we can see. But spiritually, you will begin to conceive if you will let go of bitterness, if you will let go of rebellion, and you don't suffer the witch to live. Not only will a child be born, this wasn't just any child that was born. But the child that was born was the grandfather to David, one of the most famous kings in the history of the Bible. A man that was after God's own heart. All because somebody finally was willing to get over bitterness. Because somebody was willing to get over rebellion. And when Naomi finally understood that it really wasn't that bad. Ruth was here. She never left me. She never forsook me. She was with me to the end. She helped gather food for me to eat. She took care of me. And now I have a child. I can take care of it. And notice what they called it. They didn't call it Ruth's child. They said they called it the child of Naomi. Would you stay? I hope this makes sense today. Some things can be restored. Some things can be restored, but some things cannot be restored. Some things cannot allow to live. And rebellion and bitterness cannot be allowed to live in our lives. It cannot be allowed to live in our lives. And I can tell you, I've sensed it in the church. I've sensed it in the last few weeks coming in, a little bitterness, a little rebellion coming into the church. I've come to take authority over those spirits today in the name of Jesus Christ. I take authority over the spirits of bitterness, the spirits of rebellion right now. In Jesus' name, we will not suffer the witch to live. We will not allow those spirits to live in our lives, in our church, in our families. Hallelujah, God. We're going to kill it right now in Jesus' name. Because, God, we know on the other side. If we kill it, there is rest. If we kill it, there is conception. If we kill it, then we will grow and we will have a heritage for the next generation. We will have something to pass on. If we don't, it will ultimately destroy us. I'm asking, would you lift your hands in this place? There are some of us in this place, maybe not in the last few days, maybe in the last few months or the last few years, there are some things that have gone on in your life and so started to creep in again. It's allowed some bitterness to come and you become bitter towards the situation. Ultimately, it's allowed you now to become bitter towards other people. You're starting to get bitter towards God. You're starting to wonder why you're here, why you bother coming. I'm telling you, you have to kill it. Don't let it live. Don't let those thoughts live. In your life, don't let those thoughts live in your spirits. When they try to sneak up at you in the midnight hour, you've got to kill them right then and there. You say, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. If a, a past fault or failure comes into your life, you need to understand that it's been forgiven. Or if the devil reminds you of somebody that hurts you, you need to understand that it's already been forgiven. You have already forgiven it. And it is dead. It's done. We're not going to rehash old wounds. We're not going to open old wounds. And if you haven't forgiven, the time today, the time to forgive is now, the time is today. If you haven't forgiven somebody because of something they've said or an action that's been done, you've allowed it to paralyze your walk and paralyze your feelings and paralyze your emotions. If you've let it happen, then it's doing its purpose. It's sucking poison into your spiritual body and sucking poison into your life and ultimately will drive you crazy but today is a day that we can come in and gather ourselves back and say God I'm going to forgive my brother I'm going to forgive my sister I'm going to forgive my church member I'm going to forgive my family member God I'm going to go to those that I know I've hurt and I'm going to ask for their forgiveness I'm not going to harbor any ill feelings. I'm not going to harbor rebellion. I'm going to line up with what you have asked me to do according to the word of God. I'm going to line up with what you've spoken to me. And I'm going to do it because you've asked me to. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Would you lift your hands in this place? I'm asking if you would just begin to search yourself, search your heart, your mind, and your spirit. 
know we started this service now by worshiping and shouting and jumping. But I believe that today God is ordaining us a time to come in and just get ourselves right one more time. Cleanse ourselves out of any ill feeling, any ill thought, whether it be towards God or somebody else. Thoughts of rebellion, things or actions that we've taken where nobody else was looking, knowing that it was wrong, but we did it anyway because we've let that spirit of rebellion alive in our lives. Would you come up front to an altar today? Would you come up front to an altar and find a place and just say, God, wash me from my head down to my feet. Wash my emotions, my heart, my mind. God, if there's anything in me there shouldn't be, would you take it out and strengthen me? Search, as David said, search me, O oh God, and know my thoughts. Try me and know my heart. And see if there be any wickedness in me. But I'm asking, God is asking, don't allow a witch to live. Don't allow something of the past hold you back. Don't allow something that will just stay in your life and grow and consume you like a cancer. But take the victory over it today in Jesus' name. Kill it once and for all. And let God do a work of healing in your life today. Would you count? Would you pray? Find somebody if you need to ask forgiveness. Find somebody and ask forgiveness.